Hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, film discussion on the awakening of Moti Wolkenbuch with the author Thomas Mayer. We're very pleased to have you today. Um, my name is Stephanie. I'm with the Swiss Consulate in Vancouver. And before we start with our discussion, I would like to um, give you a little heads up on the structure of today's event. So we will start with, a, with an interview. We have a moderator here today. It's Charlotte Chalier from the University of Victoria. Um, Charlotte Chalier is a fellow Swiss and she is a professor for German studies. Um, then after the interview, we would like to open the floor to every one of you. So for your questions, um, whenever you have something to say, please let us know by using the chat function. Um, so when you look at your Zoom screen, at the very bottom, you have a little speech bubble, an icon with the words chat. If you click on there, another window will open and there you can uh, let us know. You can write us a little message and let us know if you have something to say. Okay, that's it. So maybe a few words about the awakening of Motti Wolkenbuch. It is a real success story. It was Thomas Meyer's very first novel, actually. In 2012, he wrote his first book and it became an instant success, a bestseller. And just a few years later, he was approached um, to help making it into a movie. And he wrote the screenplay. Again, his very first screenplay. And again, an instant success, the most successful Swiss movie of 2018. And now even the first Swiss feature film on Netflix. So we're very excited to have you today and are interested to hear from you. And with this, I give over to you, Charlotte. Welcome, um, at Thomas, and it's the evening in, in Switzerland. And so thank you for staying up for us. I have to um, issue a little warning. Um, my son fell asleep at 6 p.m. Uh, today, that's three hours ago, and he might wake up again and walk into the room. So perfect. Just so you know. It's great. This is what Zoom is all about these days. <laughs> So we'll get to know another family member. So I'm, I'm very excited that I can um, ask you a few questions and it will take around 10, 15 minutes and then we open it up to, um, to the general audience and you get some questions from, from viewers. So uh, as, as Stephanie said, uh, the book, the film is based on, on, on a book uh, that was published in 2012, Welcome Brooks' Wondrous Journey into the Arms of a Shix. And that's it, exactly, thank you. And it, the book and the film take place in the Orthodox Jewish community in the Viedekon district in, in Zurich, in Switzerland. And I think it's important to say that Zurich is not only the largest city in Switzerland, but it has also has the biggest and diverse Jewish population. And I noticed that often in interviews, uh, Thomas, uh, you asked about the Jewish community in Zurich or in Switzerland, and that just does not exist. It is, it is very broad, it is diverse. And the ultra Orthodox, the Orthodox are one specific um, segment of that community, but there is progressives, liberals, there is um, secular Jews, um, non-practicing. And so I think that's very important when we talk about there's no such thing as the Jewish community in Switzerland. The film, as the book, features dialogue in German and, and Yiddish. And if I'm correct, uh, I looked at Amazon, the book is now in its 13th edition. Is that correct? Well, um... Can you keep track? Not to brag, but the paperback is in its 13th uh, edition. There was also a hard copy and that had um, 10 editions. And that really is, is wonderful and a great success. And congratulations on that. And so I wanted to ask you a specific question about um, that, that I thought was, was very interesting in terms of how your own experience went into it or not. And uh, was, as far as I know, you, from your interviews, you did not grow up in a religious household. You're, you're a secular, largely a non-practicing Jew. And in an interview reflected on how a lot of your experiences did actually go into this book, even though the story reflects experiences of Orthodox uh, Jews. And one, one quote um, I would like to use, I thought it's beautiful and I'd like to start with it. You said in that interview, it is not about a clash of cultures. 
It is a clash between the path that is designed for you by your culture and your parents and the path that is within you that you want to live. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I'd love to. Um, well, as, as you've already mentioned, I, I wasn't brought up um, religiously. Uh, and only my mother is Jewish. My father is Christian. And my mother descended from a non-religious family. So all the traditions um, didn't play uh, any role in my life. But still, um, since she was brought up in a secular way, my mother was yearning for, for more Judaism in her life. And she took me to synagogue a few times and uh, I, I really could not understand what, what the meaning of it was, um, why I should be there amongst all these people I don't know, reading in a book I couldn't understand. I, I just didn't see the point. And she, well, she wasn't able to to explain it to me in a way that I would understand. And so that that was it with me and Judaism on a religious level. But of course, um, there's also a Jewish identity. If you have a Jewish mother, you feel as a Jew, whether you want that or not. And um, I was surprised that uh, even though I, I never lived religiously, so much Judaism was inside me one, waiting to, to get out. So we have, uh, I think it's 200 and... 67 pages of Judaism that were waiting inside of me to to uh, take form. Um, and of course, the story inside here is about a young man who, who has to find out what he wants and um, has to fight against the plans his parents had for him. And this has nothing to do with Judaism or Christianity or anything else. It's a, it's a universal theme i think and yes my parents <laughs> jewish or not they had very specific plans for for me and my life um they wanted me to be an officer in the swiss army and they wanted me to be a lawyer and i've already um, settled onto that path but i realized that it's not my life and and i uh, i stopped going there and i took on in a different direction so what Motti Wolkenbruch is going through Thomas Mayer went through as well mostly mm -hmm. because Motti Wolkenbruch after all is still a fictitious character in a book he is and I, I, I'm not a religious Jew and I don't know much about orthodox um, the, the, the orthodox way of, of life and I had to buy a book uh, called uh, Wie Juden Leben, How Jews Live. Um, it's not a very specific title, it should say How Orthodox Jews Live uh, or Religious Jews Live and all the traditions, how you get up in the morning and uh, how you say the brucha uh, mm -hmm. to every meal and uh, almost anything. I had to, to, to read about that because I didn't know anything about it. So here I'd like to ask you about the use of Yiddish, which is very, very pronounced in the book and to a lesser extent in the film. The film mediates the Yiddish and makes it accessible to German language speakers. And so in that interview, you also said, so when your mother gave your book with Yiddish expressions, it was like a chest full of gold doublons, like a, like a treasure. Box. Do you want to say a little bit more about how, how important Yiddish became for you? Well, let me maybe um, hook on your, your first question a bit in order to answer this one. Um, Wolkenbruch is, is not a Jewish name. It's a, it's a mock-up Jewish name, like uh, Rosenfeld and, and Goldstein and stuff. So... I had this, this word play, Wolkenbruch would be a nice Jewish name. And, and this is not a book, it's not a novel, it's just some joke in my brain. And after that, I had the idea of this young religious Jew from Zurich, um, because we have a, a, 
like you said, it's not one uh, community, it's, it's several communities and there's the Hasidic community and the Orthodox community. And, and of, of course I see these people. And I had this vision of one of these young men falling in love with, with uh, an, a shiksa, a non-Jewish woman. And that also is not yet a book. And then I, I started writing um, because I, I found the idea very, how, how can I say, it was lovely. It, it was a lovely idea to me to, to, to write about uh, this difference. And all the, the Jewish words I knew from my mother, I, I put them into it. And um, there were many, so I asked her for, for Jewish dictionaries and she gave me some. And that was this uh, uh, chest that opened up for me. I was I was absolutely delighted um, about these cute little words. I mean, in Yiddish you can say the worst stuff, and it still sounds really nice. This is this is amazing. So I was somewhat ignited, and and I I kept on writing, and out came a book. This was not my intention. And, and if I had an intention, I don't know if, if I would have started yet finished, but I did. And when people first asked me, uh, is this autobiographic? I said, no, not at all, because I'm not uh, orthodox and this is not my story, it's all fictional. And um, my mother read the book and uh, <laughs> she told me I recognized myself on every page in here and I thought well well why not you're also a very dominant woman mother but still it's not my life and a few months months passed and um, other people read the book her friends and obviously unanimously they told her this is you Vera you have also been very Yiddish to your children. And only then I realized how much of myself I poured into this book without um, wanting that. Um, the Yiddish part, of course, uh, like I said, it's, uh, I only had these, I don't know, let's say 10 verbs and, and five expressions from my mother and my grandmother. And from that moment where my mother handed me those uh, dictionaries, I, I, um, I was hooked with Yiddish and with Moti and, and with my own Judaism. I just want to explain to those that don't speak German, Wolkenbruch, how would you translate that into English? Oh, well, you shouldn't because it's a name, but uh, if, if you would, literally, it, it would be a cloudburst. A cloudburst, yeah. So I'm looking at the time and I'd like to ask one more question, and that is, how did you approach um, the film adaptation? So the book draws I mean, to a lot... If, if, I'm, if I'm telling you this right. Um, Wolkenbruch. It is a sudden cloudburst, it's correct. It is? Yeah. Downpour. Heavy Downpour. Shore. Cloudburst, yeah. torrential rain. I think, I think it is very reflective of his character in some ways too. So if I have one more question, I'd like to talk to you about the film adaptation. Huh? So the book draws to a large extent on Mordechai more Morty's interior monologue, which is very challenging to translate that into a visual language. So how did you... Um, First of all, how did this end up being a film? And, and how did you end up um, translating this very intricate interior monologue into a film language? That was the problem. Um, I think like two months after the book has been published, the, this film producer from Zurich called me and, and he told me that he wanted to make this into a movie. And there was this um, meeting with him and the publisher and, and me. And uh, the, pub the, the producer said, I want you to write the screenplay. And I told him, I have not done that before. How should I be capable of, of doing it? And, and he said, we'll give you a coach and 
you, you'll do fine. And when I started, I, this was the task. Um, I, I had to take on. This is in first person view. So it says, I, Moti, uh, I do this and I think about that and I want to have this. So this is not something you can give to a director because he would have to shoot the face of uh, the, the main character and it would be really boring. So I had to translate this into dialogues and, and actions. And for someone who had never done that, it was quite demanding. But I had the help of, of, of a real screen, <laughs> screen writer, so I was fine. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think uh, we can open it up to um, general audience. Yes, so please, anybody, if you have a comment or a question, um, let us know through the chat function, maybe to break the ice. I also have a question for you, Thomas Meyer. Um, so this movie is a lot about a predetermined path and your own path, right? So in the movie, we have this very... Um, this orthodox family, very strict family, who tells Moti how to live his life, and he wants to break out of this. But on the other hand, we have a very interesting character. It's Miss, I think, Silberzweig is her name, that older lady that uses tarot cards to tell the future. So, and Moti is very eager to know his future through those tarot cards. So we're still not speaking of a completely free will, right? He is he wants to know what lies ahead of him or what, what was the, the function of this lady and her tarot cards in your opinion? To be honest, um, it was my first book and in, in, it is somehow a very innocent book because I, I just started it without any intention of having a book at the end. I just, started it because it was fun to write it and this this old lady uh, called Silberzweig um, it's uh, that would be translates to silver branch and her tarot cards I wasn't thinking about the function or or any of this technical stuff because it just went out of my fingers into into my laptop and the book to be honest, it has several flaws. I would, I would do it differently today. I would do it more technically. And, but that would be a different book. So this, um, this woman with the tarot cards, she's just there because I liked her. It was a very childlike way of telling a story. Um, so I don't really know what to tell you. What I do just you, like still. Yeah. What do you like <laughs> about her? I mean, I liked her too, but what do you what do you like about her? Why is she such a um, a nice character for you? Because she's so open to to life. Mm -hmm. um, I know a few, not many, but I know a few ex Orthodox Jews from Zurich. And one of them told me that he started to ask a question when he was 11 years old. Why do I have to do this? Why do we do this? Why is this necessary? And in my point of view, you can only be an, an Orthodox Jew or, or a religious person if you follow the rules of, without asking about them. A student, as soon as you, if you start questioning the rules, they have no meaning left for you. And this, this guy, he said, I started asking questions when I was 11. I was still uh, wearing a kippah when I was 25. And now when you meet him in the street, you would not think that he, he had been uh, an Orthodox Jew. He's now, he has now tattoos and, and looks like any, any other guy in the street. And given his story, I, I thought, I would have been a very bad Orthodox Jew because I also would have asked questions. I did. When my mother took me to synagogue, I was seven years old and I said, what's the meaning of all this? I don't see a point. And this, uh, 
silver zweig woman she's a bit like uh, me and and my ex orthodox friend she she's a liberal mm -hmm. Mopti is welcome in her house whatever he does he's not welcome in uh, his parents house whatever he does he's only welcome if he follows the path and they don't really tell him what to do because they don't question what's to be done they just expect him to follow and as soon as he doesn't um he has a lot of problems but not with uh, mrs silberzweig she welcomes him anyway and that's what i liked about her and if you want to analyze that Uh, you could say I liked her so much because I never had someone like that in my life. Mm -hmm. I had to be that for myself. Yeah. Maybe this is why she's so open. Yeah. And yeah. forgiven. Just, do you mind if I ask a follow-up question regarding um, the Orthodox community? Uh, Thomas, did you get anybody from the orthodox community in Zurich a to read the book watch the film and respond did you get any feedback um well pe people asked me that when when i uh, had my first readings there were three uh, popular questions <laughs> that were always asked. Yeah. one are you jewish and i said yes i am second is it autobiographic and i already answered that and the third one is what do the orthodox jews in zurich say to that book <laughs> it's a good all, question it's a good question but it, it the, the question implies that the orthodox jews are a homogenic mass that looks alike acts alike and thinks alike in all aspects of life and And uh, the question implies that they would have all the same opinion towards that book. And of course they don't. Some uh, told me that the title um, is offensive to them, but still they wish me luck with the book. And I met a guy from a very orthodox community and he, um, not only did he read the book and like it, he also contacted me to, to meet me and tell me that. So there's also a spectrum there. And, and well, the people who would not read it or would read it and would not like it, of course, they wouldn't tell me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. But I know that uh, quite a few people from, from the Orthodox communities and the religious communities liked the book. Why wouldn't they? It's funny. It pokes, it uses humor, parody, satire, pokes fun, it's self-deprecating. And, and you're, you're absolutely right to say that is, it is diverse, even within this community that's very self-contained. It is diverse too. And, and I think what, what I found interesting when I looked at, at the interviews with, with you, it's often, it's often uh, assumed that there is this, this Jewish identity. And, and I think it was because, of course, you use stereotypes as well. And, but we, we want to talk about that later because there are two questions now. Um, yeah, let's get back to that because I have something to say to that. And, and I can read the questions here. Nina Bader, she wants to know, how did it come that you wrote a sequel? In earlier interviews, you mentioned you were not planning to write a second book on Moti. Um, yes. I confess, I did, a, I did write a sequel, um, here it is. It's called Wolkenbruchs Waghalsiges Stell dich ein mit der Spionin. How would you translate that, Charlotte? Um, I have, um, Stell dich ein, no idea. Stell well, dich ein is one well, of we, the we, we could do it rawly and say it would, would translate to Wolkenbruchs Adventurous Rendezvous with a spy. Rendezvous is good, yes. Okay, uh, I did write a sequel. Um, And it's true, uh, Nina, I did not uh, plan to write a sequel because this uh, book, for me, it, it was uh, perfect in the Latin meaning of, of the word, uh, finished. Um, and only three years after that, I had the idea that it would be funny to 
um, write a book about the Jewish world conspiracy and to to claim that it really exists, but it uh, it's a, a group of failures. And it took me another three years to, to publish it, but it was not nearly as successful as the first book. And well, anything I do is not as successful as the first book. And I still have to learn to really live with that. But I did do a sequel. Do you, <laughs> do you think you, just a follow up question, do you think um, you will make a movie on the second book as well? Um, well, this is not up to me. It is up to any um, film production firm who would uh, take on this adventure. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been one yet, even though I think um, it would make a nice movie. It would make a funny movie and it would make a movie with lots of, of absurd scenes. I, will, I personally would love to see that movie and this is this is how i write my books i write books that i personally would love to read and same with the movies and you probably surprise the audience because they they come with the expectation of the first movie and then i didn't get the chance yet to read the second book but i feel like it has a completely different angle so you well, probably surprised the audience very much. Surprised, and uh, what really happened it was uh, I disappointed them, many of them. I, I, I think I gained a new audience with this book here, but I also lost um, many <laughs> Volkenbruch fans um, mm -hmm. because it's so different. Mm -hmm. And Well, I could have made a, a typical sequel and tell the same story with the same characters but I didn't want to because I thought that I had already told that story I wanted to do something different and of course by doing that I knew there was the risk of well making many many people angry and that happened mm -hmm. I, I to be honest I had to stop reading Amazon's um, what's the word for recension uh, reviews reviews mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I quit reading them because some of them were so mean um, it was hurting it was very hurtful I have to say mm -hmm. but still if you know someone who wants to make the second movie let me know <laughs> okay <laughs> Beatriz uh, no no uh, Bruce yes Bruce was the third question are the most religious Jewish mothers so dramatic as in the movie or just be exaggerated well I, I, I would uh, not want to say how Jews or Jewish mothers are because uh, that doesn't work but um, What can I say? Uh, the, the stories of dramatic mothers, and I have heard many of them, um, are very dramatic, but they have nothing to do with Judaism or, or anything else. Um, I just heard today from a young woman um, who broke up with, uh, with her boyfriend, and her mother was so devastated that she told her, you don't have to come uh, to me anymore. So this is also very, very dramatic, but it's not a Jewish mother. And yes, I exaggerated a bit, but uh, Charlotte, let's talk about that uh, after. Uh, Beatrix, she wants to know, as diverse as the Jewish community is, or the Orthodox Jewish community, the story still has quite a few stereotypes and cliches, such as the dominant Jewish mother. Is that a contradiction? Um, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> well, I think, well, maybe Charlotte, let's talk about it. Um, I had to answer to that question and, and many uh, questions alike uh, many times. Um, some people even told me that I, I was mocking uh, Jews and Judaism and I don't think I was. I think there's a huge difference uh, between exaggerating a bit um, about my own people and my own lifestyle 
and say degrading things about a group of people you don't belong to. I think there's friendly cliches and hostile cliches and uh, I would not see one hostile cliche in my book. Um, I had no reason to. Why, why, why would I? I? I have no beef with anyone, uh, and not with, with the Orthodox Jews. And still, I think stereotypes and cliches can be very funny. And the Jewish mother stereotype, if you look it up in the Wikipedia, you will find that um, it is said that the Puerto Rican mother and the Italian mother they, they are very alike to the Jewish mother stereotype. And this is everything, a caricature of the mother herself. So yes, there are a few cliches in the book, um, but by making fun of them, I am not saying that the Jewish community is not diverse. I think that's that's a very important point. I'm, I'm glad you said that. And the other thing I think is important for a Jewish author, if we may even use that word, it is it can be very liberating to use these cliches and stereotypes. You can really undermine them by using them. And I think it is a big difference if it's, if it's a person within a minority, minority group using these cliches and stereotypes or not. But you know, some critics, uh, you know that Thomas went even further and accused you of anti-Semitism. It, it's, or of being a self-hating Jew. And I, I, I found that quite surprising as well. Do you wanna, do you wanna talk to, about that? Well, I found, it was one person. Yeah, uh, a colleague of mine, yes. And uh, he's, he's not a Jew and I think he's German. And I was wondering about his motive. Um, what, what he actually said was that he was smarter than anyone else, uh, smarter than, than I, smarter than the publisher, smarter than the audience, and smarter than all the journalists who liked the book and would not see that it was anti-Semitic. So he, he actually said that we were all stupid, mm -hmm. all on him. Um, and again, why would I be anti-Semitic? Mm -hmm. There would be something terribly wrong with me. And if it was, I would not have written that book. I would have written another book, uh, more uh, an open, openly anti-Semitic book if I had that issue, but I really don't. And to be honest, if it had been Marcel Reichmanitzky, a Jewish uh, literature, literature critic from Germany, who had told me that, then I would have, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know what I would have done or said or thought in that case. But if a German non-Jew tells me about anti-Semitism, I, I think I know better. Mm. Yep. Reto Schmidt says, absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Reto. Um, <laughs> IG says, I think that the character of Motti's father is very interesting. Doesn't his behavior, starting to read the paper quite often, problems occur, uh, support the strong and dominant character of the mother and her influence of the family? Uh, does he? Well, again, um, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> All the other books I did after that and the screenplay I did, I put much more thought work into them. I, I um, made much more reflections um, about the motives and, and the characters and everything. And, and in this book, let's just put it this way. The mother came out very dominantly and I think she did because mine did and uh, the father came out like he did because I liked him this way. Okay, because when I read the book I thought he is so calm, he's so quiet that I sometimes thought come on but get up, say something because I, That's what I, thought I, I, I wanted him to, to stand up against uh, yeah. <laughs> 
but he doesn't. And he doesn't. And I too had to sustain this. It was it was difficult for me too. But um, I was. How do I put this? I think I would be more invasive um, towards my own uh, characters today. Ten years ago, I, I had uh, a certain shyness towards these people that that appeared in, in in my mind, and and I didn't want to, you know, influence them. I also thought, why aren't you saying something? But I didn't make him say anything because I had this shyness and. In some way, I'm a bit sad that I lost the shyness. The, the characters in, in, in the sequel are much more designed by me. So at, the I, end, sorry. Sorry? at the end, I thought the father would be the one who, who may forgive Morty what he did, um, but, but he's able to do that because of the mother. So, uh, yeah, that was my... After a few months after I read that, I thought that maybe like that because he's really avoiding any problem that comes up. I think the father forgives Motti, Motti because he doesn't think that there's anything to forgive. <laughs> okay, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Andreas, uh, after being kicked out of his family home and of his social bubble, will Motti find his way or will he be struggling? Well, Andreas, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I uh, have the habit of giving that, uh, of giving back that question because, to be honest, um, I don't know. I'm not, what, what do you think? Well, um... Good answer, by the way. Diplomatic, <laughs> uh, isn't it? <laughs> I didn't read the book, unfortunately, but I, I will. Um, I just saw the film, and um, first of all, I, I found it um, a very, very uh, entertaining film. It, it was uh, full of humor, still on an um, on, uh, um, important issue, right? So um, I also think... Uh, you know what happened to Motti, as you said at the very beginning, doesn't only happen in, uh, in, in Orthodox Jewish families, but also in extreme um, other religions, right? So um, at the end, when I saw Motti uh, sitting uh, on, I think it was in this park on the, on the bench, he didn't really know what to do, but he wasn't, uh, he wasn't um, in a very um, sad mood, right? I thought he was smiling a little bit and he was looking with uh, interest into his future. So I do think that it, he will find his way and um, uh, with a few struggles probably because he will have to learn a lot, right, of modern society. Uh, it will take him time to, to make friends, to get to know um, uh, you know, the modern society, he will probably uh, fail a few times and he is a bit of a naive uh, young person uh, uh, now, right? So he will have to learn uh, a lot about um, modern, modern times. So this is a little bit my take. Um, I agree with, with uh, everything you said. I, I, ever since I've uh, got to know uh, this ex-Orthodox guy, I, I knew that Motti would be all right. He would, he would have to struggle, and, um, but he will be fine. There, I've seen on the Swiss television uh, a, a while back, uh, there was um, a report about um, Orthodox Jews in Israel, and they also showed people who, um, who left th their community and there was one uh, very irritating scene because there's this, um, this group of men, ex-Orthodox men, who helps other men who just had left their community in, in order to find a job, an apartment, and they had this huge wardrobe with uh, donated uh, clothes and and you could see this man in this 
huge pile of, of, of clothing and he, he was invited to pick some stuff. And uh, there were blue shirts and, and green pullovers and uh, the dark blue t-shirts, like when you go to Harlem or something like that. And, and he was standing there um, paralyzed and someone asked him, what's the problem? Why wouldn't you pick anything? And he said, it all looks alike to me. Mm -hmm. And this was so shocking because he comes from a reality where indeed everything looks alike. And when he's put into a totally different reality, he has huge trouble adapting to it, even visually. I was horrified. I mean, if he has colors and doesn't he see colors, what does that mean for anything else? So it's not just saying goodbye to your family, which by itself would be ugly enough. It must obviously mean much more. And I wish Moti all the best for that quest. It, it must be hard, I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank we you. Have a, we have a comment about this. Um, Sandra is very optimistic actually that he will do well and um, would you like to elaborate on this, Sandra? Oh, Sandra, hi. <laughs> hi, Charlotte. Hi. <laughs> How nice to see you. <laughs> you too. So, Sandra, are you in Calgary? Yes. Okay. This, is a, this is a trans-Canadian event because I see one of my other colleagues in Montreal is, is, is part of the audience too. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just seen the question. Um, Frau Silberg, Silberberg knows he is going into a new world. Everything ended, but now everything is open to him. I see this as a strong possibility that he will do well. This is what she tells him. By, um, mm. I think this is something I took out of the book into the movie without altering it too much or at all. Um, Moti is very depressed because he has lost his family, he has lost uh, the, his shiksa, um, he doesn't know where to go and she, I think um, today it's called reframing, um, she tells him no, there's not nothing, there's everything because now yeah. for the first time in your life you get to decide what you want and this is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I definitely saw that as, as, as a positive, uh, positive uh, way forward for him. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> uh, Bruce, he says, did you get any trouble after the book and movie became so successful? Maybe the Orthodox Jewish community doesn't agree how you describe them. And I'm sure there are many young Jewish are, who are confused or lost like Moti and it might encourage them to explore different things in the world, which is against their community. Well, um, I didn't get any trouble um, by Jews or non-Jews. And of course, um, there were uh, Jews who told me that the book wasn't um, very exact. But this is, um, let's say, a bit of a specific thing about, about these people. If, if you talk about, let's say, Pesach, the, the festivity in spring, um, and you say they do this and they do that, then of course, um, religious people tell you that you also have to mention this and this and this and this, then they, they want you to bring up the whole list and they tell you that you can't leave out stuff. And I told them, yes, I can. I'm not a journalist and this is not a documentary. I'm a novelist and this is fiction. So I actually can do whatever I want. And some people accepted that because they understood and others didn't. So there's a, there's a magazine uh, in Switzerland. It's a liberal Jewish magazine called Tachles. And the father, uh, he, he reads the Tachles. And someone told me, 
you know, uh, if he's from that community, he would never read the Tachlis. It's the mistake in your book. Um, it can't be. And I told him, yes, it can. Uh, here, on page 12, he does it. And uh, I was at liberty to let him do it. And, and some people would not accept that because they are convinced that if you write about something, you have to give an exact picture, no matter how vast it is. And well, it wouldn't be possible because you would lose yourself in descriptions of uh, traditions that are not relevant to the story. Uh, however, to Thomas, is it right that you did make some, I don't wanna say corrections, but within the different editions that yes. I think did change the synagogue, and others, so you did incorporate some, gently incorporate some of the criticism. Yes. Um, in the first edition, I had to admit some heavy mistakes. Uh, <laughs> I, I had done really some mistakes. I, I picked one uh, specific uh, Orthodox community and well, that itself was a mistake because I forced myself to, to adhere to, to the realistic details. And I lost some of them. And of course, that was correctly seen as incorrect. And I corrected that afterwards. So if I would do the book again, I would invent a community. So in order to protect myself from that criticism. But yes, I, I made some changes from uh, the first to the second edition. And because I could, I did it also to the third edition because each time you read your own text, even when reading to other people, um, you notice things that could be done more nicely and you can do that. And of, out of the 23 editions, I think I um, touched at least 18 because I could. Mm -hmm. So it's a work in progress to some extent. Huh? It is. Yeah. Manuel uh, says, did you think of having some Swiss German in the movie or was it clear from the beginning that what plays in Zurich would be mostly in standard German with Yiddish elements? Does it reflect the language practices in your family? Um, well, we talked about that. Is this uh, Zurich a film or is it a Swiss film or is it um, a Swiss film with a global topic? And we um, decided for the latter. We, we thought this is not something that happens in Zurich and only in Zurich and can also happen uh, in other places, even in other cultures. And um, we tried to um, when we when we did the rehearsals, we tried to uh, have Swiss German uh, next to Yiddish, and they're very close because they're both um, I don't know what's the correct expression, but there's uh, today's German is a modern version of uh, medieval German. And actually, Yiddish as well as Swiss German are medieval German dialects. They had not changed much for the last thousand years, as opposed to High German. So, um, in order to to produce um, some contrasts, we we decided to to use German instead of Swiss German. And the language practices in my family, there were uh, some Yiddish vulgarisms that I picked up from my grandmother, of course. Um, but we did not um, use whole Yiddish sentences. When you listen to um, Italian families here in Switzerland, they switch from Swiss German to Italian even in the middle of the sentence. So you have uh, three sentences in Italian, two in Swiss German, one half-half, and uh, another one is Italian again. But in my family, um, second generation uh, Yiddish, we only had, as I said, uh, 20, 30 words and some proverbs and expressions. So that was the... the practice in my family. 
Grace. Hello, Grace. You, uh, you're asking, why did you make Laura call Motti at the end when it is kind of obvious, to me at least, that their love would not last very long? Um, why did I do that? Well, the, the screenplay is, when you're writing a book, you can actually decide almost everything. You have the publisher and the, the lector who would tell you, you maybe, maybe you, you illustrate this a bit more and this is not very logical and stuff, but you're the boss. And uh, when you do a screenplay, there's several people involved. You have the production, you have the director. Um, so in the end, I think, I wanted to do it a bit differently than like this. I'm not sure what the final decision was because it's, it's true, their love would not last very long, but still I think Laura had a bit of a bad conscience because she kicked Motti out and at least she wanted to know how he was doing. This is why she called him, as far as I remember. I, I don't recall all of my decisions. <laughs> Thank you. If I can uh, jump in there, um, I was actually wondering in the movie, it's not clear whether Moti picks up the phone or not. What is your intention? Is he going to reply to the phone call or is he not going to pick up? My intention is that it doesn't matter. I think it doesn't matter because, mm -hmm. first of all, I th I'm pretty positive that he will do fine. Um, I don't think that Laura is uh, the one and only and now they will get to get back together because it will be cheap and not very realistic, but um, it doesn't matter. And this is why I, I wanted to have this open end that could go in different directions. And in the book, it's even more like this. I don't know if uh, you have seen, um, it is, it's a movie by the Cohen brothers. It's called uh, A Special Man or something like that. And in the end, um, there's this thunderstorm coming up and the main character is called in by his doctor to, well, it's obvious that he has cancer and they have to talk about it. and lots of questions arise and you want to know what happens next. And the Cohen brothers, they just had the chutzpah to end the movie. And it was, it was amazing. I, I have seen it with my sister and she was outraged. She said, you can't do that. You, this is not an ending for a movie. And I said, yes, it is. Because now you're connected to the story. I don't want people to put my book in the shelf and it's everything is clean and and set. That's boring. I want them to reflect on how they would act next. So I can ask you, do you think he picks up the phone? I strongly hope he doesn't. After all the struggle, I hope that <laughs> you hope he, hope he, doesn't. he does not. I want him to now finally found, find his own way, you not know, be influenced by the mom or this, this pretty uh, student or whoever, just focus on yourself, figure out what you want in life and don't run after her, go back to that apartment. I want him to, to say no to this. I do too. Yeah. But I also want people to think about what they want. And That's with an hard. open... <laughs> With an open end, this is this mm -hmm. is actually you're asking a question. What happens next? What would you do? Mm -hmm. But you don't pronounce it. You just uh, initiate it by walking away. Mm -hmm. This is what I liked about the movie and the book and and all other artworks that do the same. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So um, we have a few more questions. Um, oh, thank you. And uh, Rito Schmid, I've seen your private message and uh, thank you for it. Um, 
are your readings in Switzerland in Swiss German or in standard German? Well, they're in standard German because the book is. And um, for me, it's much more professional if, if I uh, stick to that language. I, I don't speak Swiss German professionally. Thanks. And there was also a question just before by Susan or Susan. Um, she wanted to talk a bit about the actor who plays Motti. How was he chosen and how was it playing the role for him? Do you know? Uh, he, he was chosen uh, very swiftly because he's uh, our hotshot. Um, and we all agreed that he would, he would be perfect for this. And I think he did it very well. And playing the role for him was, um, it meant a lot to him because his father is Israeli and he read the book and he told his son, if they ever make a movie out of this, you have to play this Monty character. And when they asked him, his father was very happy. You can see, you, you see the father, he's, he's the guy uh, laying in the coffin at, at the beginning of the movie, who says uh, whatever he says. It's, it's uh, Joel Basman's father, Mordechai. Uh, Menachem, sorry. <laughs> Mordechai is the, the, the main character. And uh, he's a really lovely guy. He just turned 70 last week. And he's, he's a huge fan of uh, Motti and uh, my work and his son. Um, and for, for Joel Basman, it was, it was uh, very touching to, to follow his father's advice by playing this role. Can we have a question regarding the international reception of the, of the film as it is on, on Netflix, Thomas? Did you get sponsors from North America, from Israel? Can you say a little bit about that? Yes, uh, Menachem gets lots of uh, reactions from Israel because he, he was born there, he's from Jerusalem, and uh, many of his old friends now see the movie on Netflix and uh, tell him, Menachem, it's your son, and he tells him, yes, and it's me in the coffin. <laughs> but, uh, and what was also very nice is uh, that um, there's this, uh, I don't know if they're together or not, but there's this uh, two young musicians from New York. Um, I think she she does the words and he does the music. They they do musicals together. And uh, one Jewish mother, they're both Jewish, and one mother of them, uh, they've they've uh, she's uh, seen the the movie on Netflix, and told them, you have to do a musical about that. And right now they're working on it. Of course, they were thrown back uh, by Corona, uh, like we all. But um, I hope they pick it up again. So there could be an awakening of Malti Wolkenbruch musical. There could be. There could be. And I th think there will be. Do we have any thoughts? Anything else? Thomas, you must be tired now. And your sound I'm, hasn't I'm, interrupted. I'm uh, really um, uh, surprised because uh, he, he was very tired in the afternoon and I put him on my couch for a little nap and this nap has turned out to be his sleep. This is very unusual. Um, and I'm not really tired, but it's 10 p.m. now, and I'm call. I'm gonna call my girlfriend to say goodnight, and watch a bit of Netflix myself, and then I'm going to bed. I do have a last question because on Netflix is also the other the other film, Unorthodox. Is uh, do you get to talk about it or drawing comparisons about the two different films, about what it means to leave an Orthodox community? Well, there's a, a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, I think the only parallel is that the, the writers are Jewish. Mm -hmm. It's a different story. It's a different approach. It's a different perspective. Um, everything's different. And the timing is, is 
sheer coincidence. Of course, there's Stissel on Netflix and Unorthodox and, and, and uh, the, the movie that was made out of my novel is also on Netflix and that's a pure coincidence. There was no um, intention or anything. And I, I've seen the, the mini series Unorthodox and I, I think it's done very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Stephanie? Okay, so thank you very much. I think this concludes our event. Thank you so much, Thomas Mayer, for joining us today or tonight for you. Uh, it was really a pleasure. <laughs> and to As well. Else, thank you. And everyone else, thank you so much also for joining in, for asking your questions. And if you want to stay in the loop with our upcoming events, we have an Instagram page, Facebook page, a newsletter. So just follow us and you'll always be up to date. So see you next time. And thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Thomas, as well. Have a good evening. Great for me as well. And I'm really touched and delighted that what I do extends in your part of the world and that you have dedicated one hour of your life to me and my work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.